I'm here to introduce someone who uh, really requires no introduction. Um, Bob Shippey is the author of, author of many books, including uh, Jared Tolkien, author of the century, and his new book, Laughing Shall I Die, from uh, about the, the Vikings concept of death. He's here uh, to speak to us today about uh, hero and the zeitgeist. Take it away, Dr. Shipping. Well, hello, everyone. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. I'm afraid that at my age, I think my time for intercontinental flights is over. But I just hope this is a satisfactory replacement. It always worries me a bit, the tech stuff, you know, because uh, I can see myself talking to you, <laughs> but I can't see you listening to me. So I just hope you're all still there. <laughs> well, let me start by apologizing for the word uh, zeitgeist. I, I try not to use words like that, but it struck me uh, just the other day. And it came about like this. I um, write a column for the Wall Street Journal in which I review fantasy and science fiction, which means I get sent a lot of books and they all come with a publisher's blurb attached. Now, these are naturally written with uh, great enthusiasm and um, I sometimes have to say a certain uh, over-enthusiasm. And one of them just recently told me, advertising a book, the name of which I've forgotten, heroic fantasy is now the spirit of the zeitgeist. <laughs> well, my first reaction was uh, I, I have a black belt in being pedantic, you see. And I used to think, well, zeitgeist means spirit of the age. So what you're telling me is that heroic fantasy is the spirit of the spirit of the age, which actually uh, uh, is getting towards being meaningless. <laughs> However, once I got over that, I thought, well, um, maybe the PR person here has a point. Um, it's certainly the case that heroic fantasy has become something like a dominant literary genre. It's not just the many trilogies which crowd onto the shelves in the bookstores. It's also the movies and the TV series, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, Thor movies from Marvel Comics. And there's a substantial overlap with uh, what you might call non-heroic fantasy, uh, like the Harry Potter books and films. And, and also with what you might call the TV adventure series, like Vikings and The Last Kingdom. It's a modern phenomenon. And as usual, my former colleagues in departments of literature, that's my old enemies, really. It's a phenomenon that my former colleagues refuse to look at because they're all still banging on about Henry James and James Joyce and, and modernism, something which is now so out of date, they really ought to change the name. And it doesn't help if they call it postmodernism. So they're not very interested in this kind of thing. Well, they should be. Um, so having got my little outburst out of the way, I thought um, heroic fantasy and its popularity, this is an odd phenomenon. And it's marked by three evident contradictions. And I'll tell you what they are right away. And then I look at each of them separately. Could we have slide two now, please? Here it comes. Yeah, well, contradiction one. Uh, Tolkien is, is generally hailed as the father of heroic fantasy, which isn't precisely true, but there's a case for saying it. But he himself, and I think this is precisely true, he himself never, ever uses the word hero or any of its derivatives like heroism or heroic in his fiction without some mark of qualification. I'll give you the details on that later, along with one rather mysterious case, which I'll invite you to analyze for yourselves. But this first contradiction is very odd. The second contradiction is this. As the PR person said, heroism as presented in fantasy is a very appealing idea. But the word hero itself has been steadily devalued over the centuries until now in common use as by journalists, it has almost no meaning whatsoever. There's a clash between the word and the appeal of the idea. Okay, details also to follow once more, but that's contradiction two. Contradiction three, both the contradictions above can be explained by a certain disillusionment with heroism and heroic ideals, which has obvious causes. 
if I can get off a quick self advertisement, I've just published a book about Vikings called Laughing Shall I Die, University of Chicago Press. And one of the comments I got about it straight away was from a Danish archaeologist. And what he wrote and told me was that in Scandinavia, heroism was out of fashion because it was thought to be upper class. I thought that was very surprising because the very obvious fact, and this is contradiction number three, is that for all the disillusionment during Tolkien's lifetime at least and enduring into mine, the requirement for people to be real life heroes was greater and more widespread than ever before in history. I'm just thinking of my own immediate family, both in Britain and in America. Members of it were required in the last century to sail into the Arctic Circle under constant attack from air, sea, and undersea. They were, they were required to fly bombers into Germany under attack from fighters and flak with a 50% death rate among bomber crews. They were required to march into machine gun fire like Tolkien and so many others and serve in tanks, which especially Sherman tanks regularly caught fire, at which point the hatches jammed and the crews were incinerated alive. At least two of my relatives were killed in tanks and another one was definitely killed by a jammed hatch. Though it wasn't in a tank, it was in a plane. Some of them died in ways I don't like to think about. And I'm not going to pass on what I know to the memoirs I write for my children. And I'm not saying this was unusual. I'm saying this was normal. Over the last long century, that was normal for many families in Europe and in America. And Tolkien agreed with me. He may not have liked using the word hero in fiction, but he did when he was writing about fact. In his 1936 Beowulf lecture, he's arguing that dragons are just as interesting as heroic legends. He says that dragons cast a spell even on, and I quote, men not ignorant of tragic legend and history who have heard of heroes and indeed even seen them. And he means by that, I'm sure, himself and his friend C.S. Lewis as men who have seen real life heroes, of course, in their own war service. Just a note. Tolkien served in the Lancashire Fusiliers. The highest British award for bravery is the Victoria Cross, usually awarded posthumously. And Tolkien's regiment, recruited, I won't say from the slums, but from the manufacturing towns of Lancashire, won more Victoria Crosses in World War I than any other British regiment. More than the Guards, more than the Black Watch, more than any of the crack regiments. Tolkien was very proud of that. Heroes? He'd seen them. He'd been there. So those are the three contradictions which you have on the slide. Tolkien's non-use of the word hero in heroic fantasy, the lowered meaning of the word along with the appeal of the idea, and the contrast between literary disillusionment and what was in fact a very familiar reality. Now I'm going to go back over these in reverse order. Contradiction three. Well, the disillusionment was caused by the reality. As a former pupil of King Edward School myself, like Tolkien, and you know, on these lectures, I, I always wear my old Edwardian's tie. Um, I often point out that during World War I, King Edward School lost 254 alumni killed in action, including several of Tolkien's close friends and many more of his year mates. Actually, I have here, and I'll hold it up. I don't know if you can see it. The, uh, the service record, which the school brought out in 1919. Um, it has 200 pages. There's nine or 10 names on every page. And uh, on the page I'm looking at, which is page 133, there are nine names and five of them, yeah, five of them have little crosses by them. Um, missing, presumed, killed. Missing, presumed, killed. Died of wounds, died of wounds, died of wounds. One of those five was Tolkien's closest friend, Jeffrey Bate Smith. Well, if you follow the usual rule of thumb, which is that for every man killed, you have three wounded, that's about 1,000 battle casualties, 10 complete graduating classes. Just think of your own high school and imagine what effect that would have. I've remarked before that Tolkien was one of several people whom I call traumatized authors, but 
actually what Tolkien found himself in after 19, when he was 26, was a traumatized society. World War II meant it didn't get any better. The literary result of this was that it was almost impossible to express any more the kind of innocent appreciation of heroic behavior which you got in the 19th century and which Tolkien was probably brought up on. Things just hadn't happened like that. The dominant mode was ironic, as in Richard Aldington's very bitter war novel, Death of a Hero. Well, it's not a heroic type death at all. Or Robert Graves's very dispassionate memoir, Goodbye to All That. One of the things he was saying goodbye to was the innocent appreciation of a heroic ideal. Uh, I'll just add an aside here, which is that uh, uh, I've met Robert Graves and talked to him and shaken hands with him, as I have with Tolkien. And there's a third figure I bring into this discussion, who I've also met and shaken hands with, though I was too frightened to actually talk to him. I'll come to him later. But uh, going back to the literary model, the great post-war poem was T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. And of course, The Wasteland is us. <clears throat> well, think of the Vietnam memoirs and the effect they had on society. And for Tolkien's 40 year creative period from the 1910s to the 1950s, you need to multiply by a factor of about 10. Literary heroism was dead. It was killed by real life or real death. Yes, but as I've been saying, the need for a heroic image was stronger than ever before. It had to be reinvented. And of course, Tolkien is the best example of people who reinvented it. How did he do that? Well, of course, he created hobbits. That's the new style hero. And one way of viewing them is to see them as a kind of anti-Conan. You remember Conan the Barbarian? Played by Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger on screen, invented back in the 1920s by Robert E. Howard. Conan is the classic big, dumb, muscular type of hero projected back into the very far past. Well, hobbits, in a way, are much more realistic and much more anachronistic, too. They're set in the very far past, but they're recognizably 19th stroke 20th century modern in their attitudes and in their surroundings. OK, well, that was contradiction three, literary disillusionment set against compelled reality, giving us the need for a new type of hero, a need which Tolkien fulfilled. But it wasn't just hobbits. I'm turning now to contradiction two, the appeal of the idea combined with the progressive devaluation of the word. Can we have slide three? What does the word hero mean? To answer that, we must, of course, consult the four wise clocks of Oxenford. That's Tolkien's joke, you know, from Farmer Giles of Ham. He means the four first editors of the Oxford English Dictionary. And in Farmer Giles of Ham, he quotes their definition of the word blunderbuss. And then, of course, he says that Farmer Giles' blunderbuss wasn't like that at all. It was a different kind of blunderbuss. So we must look at the definitions of the Oxford English Dictionary, which Tolkien always did, I think, partly because he, he wrote quite a lot of them. Uh, but after that, like Tolkien, we can add our own ideas to them. Well, you have the, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary definitions up on screen, so I won't uh, go, uh, go reading them out again. And you notice that um, I've given the first recorded date of each of them, and you can see they go 1387, 1586, 1661, 1697. They get later and later. Well, definition one, um, you can see what that is, but note in particular the phrase intermediate between gods and men. Our call this type the demigod type. And then there's sense two, the uh, distinguished by extraordinary valor, etc., the illustrious warrior. I'll call that the warrior type. The third type, well, what that means is, is that um, it doesn't have the connection with war anymore. You can, for instance, be a, a hero of astronomy like Galileo or a hero of medicine like Sir Alexander Fleming. And I'm not quite sure what to call these people. They are, shall we say, people looked up to but they don't have to be warriors anymore. And the fourth meaning, of course, is just anybody. Anybody can be a hero if he's the chief male personage in a poem, play, or story, even if he's an anti-hero, as they quite often are. 
Well, you can see actually that uh, the progression is from late in the, from the past to the present, towards the present, and you can also see the progression is down. Hero takes in more and more kinds of person, and it gets easier to make the grade. And I'd add to that a definition five, which isn't in the OED yet, but we'll probably get there in time. In modern use, especially in journalism, hero means, definition five, this is me, a veteran, one who has served in the armed forces of the speaker's own state. For instance, in the UK now, we have an organization called Help for Heroes, which is actually a charitable organization for veterans. Now, I'm not saying anything against veterans. Uh, they all volunteered. They're all potential heroes. But most people who served in the armed forces don't even have the opportunity to be heroes. Not anyway in, shall we say, sense two. Um, so the word has actually uh, dwindled steadily in meaning. Well, it's obvious what I'm going to say, which is that Tolkien's heroes cover the whole spectrum from sense one to sense four but not sense five, I think, because that came into use rather after his time. But before I uh, give the details on that, um, let me point to a rather similar ladder or scale. And this time is a scale of literary genres defined by the nature of their heroes. And if we could add slide four now. This is the observation, and it's one of the really useful critical observations made long ago by Professor Northrop Fry. He proposed that all literature could be divided into five modes, and you see what they are. And each of them is defined by the nature of the characters, romance in which the characters are superior to others and to their environment, high mimesis in which the characters are superior to others, but not to their environment. As uh, Professor Fry, Fry said, like the word hero, Western literature has been steadily climbing down the ladder for about 3,000 years. Romance, you might say, is King Arthur and Merlin. High mimesis is Hamlet and Othello. Uh, low mimesis is the novel from Jane Austen to the present. And as for irony, well, uh, I mentioned him already. See uh, James Joyce's Ulysses. The hero of which Leopold Bloom is frankly sub-average and a hero only in the Oxford English Dictionary sense for the central male person in a story. Uh, another thing you might note is that it's beginning to look as if when you get to the bottom of the ladder, irony, you're back in touch with the top again, because of course, James Joyce's novel is called Ulysses, and it is a kind of ironic version uh, of the Homeric Odyssey. So maybe this ladder of literary modes isn't a ladder, it's, maybe it's a cycle. When you get to the bottom, you go back to the top again. Maybe that's why heroic fantasy is making a comeback, because people are looking for something which is up there at the top of the ladder again. Still, uh, the main point is that, as I say, the hero scale and the Fry scale of literary modes are similar to each other, notably in the direction of travel. Uh, and that's contradiction three. Heroic fantasy, yes, very popular, but the word hero, uh, sorry, contradiction two, I should say. Um, heroic fantasy, very popular, but the word hero means less and less. Well, now I'm back to contradiction one. How do these two scales fit Tolkien? The hero scale, surprisingly well, except that as I've said, Tolkien uses the word surprisingly little. If my computer searchable copy of the Silmarillion is correct, Tolkien never uses the word hero in the Silmarillion at all. In spite of the fact that it's got characters in it who fit sense two and even sense one of the OED's four definitions pretty well perfectly. You remember I drew your attention to the phrase intermediate between gods and men. Well, uh, that's what Arundel is, isn't he? He's absolutely intermediate between gods and men. In fact, he's a mediator between gods and men. That's what he is. Uh, Beren, well, um, he isn't immortal, uh, but he comes back from the dead. Turin is certainly distinguished by extraordinary valor. In fact, just going back to uh, some of our definitions, if you want a definition of uh, the demigod, you might look at someone like Achilles in Homer, who is the, uh, the son of a king and of the nymph Thetis. 
Well, um, uh, Tor, again, is the son of a human king and the elf princess, Idril. So he is a, a really very much up there in sense one, the demigod sense. Beren is um, certainly a figure of romance. He's superior to others and to his environment because he can come back from the dead. And Turin actually is a very strong example of, uh, of our sense two, the, uh, the mighty warrior. Uh, the person distinguished for his extraordinary valor and martial achievements. Well, okay, so uh, uh, Tolkien has a, a heroic spectrum all the way from the top, pretty much down to the bottom. But he hardly ever uses the word. So if we could have slide five, we can look at The Hobbit, where the word is used, again, if my computer searchable copy is right, exactly five times. And here are all five uses. Uh, you'll see that four of them uh, are marked by the word, um, actually four of them have the word not attached. Gandalf right at the start says that slaying dragons is going to be very difficult, not without a mighty warrior, even a hero. I tried to find one, but there aren't any anymore. Okay, um, meanwhile, uh, we're told that dwarves are not heroes. And we're told, of course, that Bilbo, this is uh, waking up after being unconscious at the Battle of the Five Armies. He says, at any rate, I am not yet one of the fallen heroes. So the dwarves aren't heroes and, and Bilbo says he isn't a hero. Uh, the only other example is, of course, the, the second one there. Uh, in those days of our tale, there were still some people who had both elves and heroes of the North for ancestors. So there could be heroes. But they're in the past, even in the past of The Hobbit. They're in the far past. They're not there anymore. OK, uh, how about Lord of the Rings? And if we could have slide six. In the Lord of the Rings, the count goes up to six uses. That's six words out of 525,000, which is a pretty small proportion, especially as it's the major work of heroic fantasy. And here are five of them. Well, you can see what they are on the screen. Um, the first two are the sort we've had before, sense to the mighty warrior. But they're both very firmly in the past, uh, hero of old wars and in the first age. They're not there anymore. As for number three, this is Sam after he has uh, temporarily got possession of the ring. And he's, for a moment, he sees himself as the ring wielder. And he has this wild fantasy of him becoming a hero. Samwise the strong hero of the age. And then, of course, he realizes this is just not going to happen. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an image. It's an ideal. But, but it's not going to happen. It can't happen for anybody like him. And then we have the uh, other two uses, which is actually Sam talking and talking uh, about and then talking to Gollum. I wonder if he thinks he's the hero or the villain. Gollum. Would you like to be the hero? And this is very, very obviously. It's so obvious. I think it must be deliberate. I think Tolkien had looked the word up in the Oxford English Dictionary and thought, yeah, that's a meaning. I must work that in somewhere. This is the <laughs> meaning where all you are is the, the center uh, of, a, of a story. Um, Gollum, actually, uh, going back to Northrop Fry's Ladder of Modes, he's an ironic figure. You know, he's right down at the bottom of, of the grades, and he could only become a hero if he became, which he doesn't, the central figure of a story. That's the only sense in which he could be regarded as a hero. And in fact, he doesn't become the central figure of a story. I guess we're all heroes of our own story, but this is no longer any kind of a distinction. Okay, that's five uses out of six. Now, the sixth one, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll show it to you, and then you, you know, I like to say, I don't think we can actually do it technically, but I'm going to say you can tell me what you think, but I'll tell you what I think. So if we could have a slide six, no, it's slide seven coming up, and this is at the Council of Elrond, and uh, after a long and weary discussion, which is hedging around the fact that some poor soul has to take the ring into Mordor to destroy it, Bilbo volunteers and says he'll do it. Um, well, I've given quite a long quotation there because you can see that this suggestion is immediately regarded by Boromir as uh, strange, surprising, and perhaps comic. The laughter died on his lips 
when he saw that everybody else was, was looking at Bilbo with grave respect. But then Gandalf says, um, well, actually, uh, you didn't really start the affair uh, and, and we're not asking you to finish it. Um, in any case, he says, only a small part is played in great deeds by any hero. You need not bow, though the word was meant. Well, um, what do you make of that? We're told very deliberately that the gravity with which this is taken means that, and indeed Gandalf says, uh, says it himself, he means the word seriously. He does not mean it in sense four, like Sam talking about Gollum. He means that Bilbo is a hero. But uh, why does Bilbo bow? That's the question. Um, uh, my, my take on it is uh, uh, we're meant to see that he's embarrassed. He takes it as a compliment and he gets up and he bows to acknowledge that he's understood the compliment, but he doesn't think it really applies to him. He's saying, in effect, uh, thanks for the kind word, Gandalf, but who, me? Us hobbits, we can't be heroes. Of course, Bilbo's wrong about that. They can be heroes sense four, and they, and they are, but anyone can be that. They can't really be heroes sense one or sense two demigods or mighty warriors. What they can be is heroes sense three, and those are people who exhibit greatness of soul. And that's true of Bilbo and Frodo and Sam as well. So the word hero there, I think, in that one anomalous use is brought up in a way which asks you to query it and then to see that it is, in a sense, true, but not perhaps in the, in the sense which you might expect. Well, uh, hobbits are a new style hero and uh, one very suitable for the, the democratic nature of modern warfare, where what people have had to do is what Frodo and Sam do, which is plug on and not get disheartened. But it's obvious that Tolkien has deliberately given us a whole heroic spectrum to choose from. Now, I must say that my thoughts on this were triggered by a PhD thesis written in 2008 in Finland. And if we can have slide eight, uh, you'll have the reference to it if anyone wants to look at it. Though I have to say that I just now tried to access it and I uh, couldn't immediately get through to it. I think one would have to fiddle, ra fiddle around a bit with one's Google to get to it. And in any case, uh, it's actually in Finnish, which uh, I expect none of us can read and that includes me. Um, well, just the same, uh, Harry here, Tiko, is a lecturer in business studies and he sees Tolkien as a valuable guide to leadership theory. The uh, four questions he asked are, are as on the slide. Uh, I don't know much about the answers he got because the thesis is in Finnish and I've only read the, uh, the short English summary. But I thought actually these were kind of interesting questions. Briefly, Harry indicates three types of leader, which he classifies as active. Active leaders include Gandalf, Saruman and Sauron. And then there's passive leaders, and he classifies these as Galadriel, Theoden, and Denethor. I must say I boggled over that. I thought uh, Theoden's a passive leader? Uh, well, okay, I didn't read the whole thesis, so I don't know what he means by that. <laughs> uh, and the third group is uh, the heroic leader, quote, specializing in project work. <laughs> that were uh, Aragorn and Frodo. Well, okay, uh, as I say, I don't really get this at all, but having got the idea and having figured that this was quite a good question, I thought um, I'd work my own little, uh, little schema out. And that's slide nine, if we could have that up. Uh, I'd say that uh, adapting uh, the uh, question about leadership to my concern with heroes, I'd say we have very clear types of heroism and of leadership. And I'll just look at these one at a time. There's the sacrificial leader, the heroic sacrificial leader, an obvious case being Theoden. Some would say that the first duty of a leader is to get killed in order to encourage the troops. <laughs> and now uh, I hope you'll indulge me by allowing me an aside here. Uh, and there's a reason why I'm saying this aside. This is in fact is the third case of somebody I've met 
shaken hands with and been too frightened to talk to. The most successful British general of the 20th century was Bill Slim, the hero of the Burma War. He was very popular with the troops because they knew he'd been shot five times. Yeah, and three of those times were after he became a general. Uh, when his staff late on in the war uh, tried to persuade him not to command from whispering distance of his lead rifleman uh, and cunningly told him it would be very bad for morale if he got killed. Uh, Slim uh, replied to them very cheerfully. Uh, he was another old Edwardian uh, like uh, like me and Tolkien, uh, and he never quite lost his brummy accent. Well, when they said it would be bad for morale if he got killed, he replied, nonsense. Nothing cheers up British troops more than a dead British general. <laughs> why, why, why do I mention Slim? Well, not only was he a year mate of Tolkien's at King Edward School, I only found this out recently, he was also a Catholic. They went to the same primary school. They must have known each other from the age of eight. If you'd asked Tolkien to name a real life hero, I bet he'd have said, real life hero? Well, the one you want is my old friend Bill. Bill Slim, and he'd be right. Okay, well, that's the uh, the uh, heroic sacrificial leader. Yes, but we also have the suicidal leader, Denethor. This is, in a way, a perversion of the heroic ideal. Obvious examples in the 20th century. But what's the difference between Theoden and Denethor? They're both brave men. I think the big difference to me is uh, visibility. Theoden's out front, where everyone can see him. Denethor is up in his tower, watching the Palantir, and in my opinion, drawing the wrong conclusion from it, so that he then goes on to commit suicide. We have also, well, I'm going down my list, aren't I? The horribly persuasive leader, which is Saruman. Again, obvious examples in the 20th century. We have the nationalistic hero, Boromir. Again, obvious examples in the 20th century. But then we have the archaic heroes like Dain, the king of the dwarves, or, or Helm Hammerhand in one of the appendices from the, the history of the riders. And these are, in a way, archaic heroes. Don't make them like that anymore. That's the old style hero. I won't say the Conan the Barbarian type because they're cleverer than he is, but just the same, same sort of spirit. Then we have. Um, this is getting a bit close to what Harry talks about, people specializing in project work, though I still don't quite get it. But we get uh, heroes who actually work at uh, unifying uh, different bodies, like elves and humans and the other species, or in Faramir's case, uh, Gondor and Rohan. And then we have the, the dutiful hero, the particularly modern, the almost anachronistic type, type the Hobbit type, like Frida, Frodo and Sam. And then we have, I think, the ideal hero, who is also the ideal leader, who is Aragorn. And you could say quite a lot, obviously, about what his good qualities are. Well, um, these last few, uh, Faramir and Galadriel, Frodo and Sam and Aragorn, the earlier ones, I think, we've got plenty of contemporary examples of them from history. But for those five, it would be quite hard to find ancient analogues. Those are a modern type. Well, it's an interesting kind of exercise to stack up Tolkien's spectrum of heroes against the heroic spectrum we're offered in, say, Game of Thrones, to see how things have changed between the 1950s, when Lord of the Rings was published, and now 60 years later. George Martin's heroes and heroines include Daenerys Targaryen. Uh, she's pretty much a heroine, close to, to the OED sense one, the demigod. She can hatch out dragons. She's impervious to fire. She's not really, really human, it seems to me. Then there's Jon Snow. You know nothing, Jon Snow. I like that phrase, don't know why. Anyway, uh, Jon Snow is very much sense two, the warrior, except he too, you'll remember, comes back from the dead. Then we have Tyrion Lannister, the dwarf, who is very much sense three. He's not a mighty warrior. He's not a demigod, but he is. He's the cleverest person in Game of the Thrones, and he's a character that one can look up to. And then we've got, uh, well, there's lots of them, aren't there? There's Brienne of Tarth, the female version of Sense 2, the mighty warrioress, you might say. Um, we've got Samuel Tarly, 
that's as near as George Martin ever gets to a hobbit. And we have Arya Stark, who actually, thinking about Northrop Fry's ladder of literary modes, the thing about Arya, compared with all her relatives, is she spends most of her time in a low mimesis world. She's down there, you know, in the gutter. Um, she's, a, she's on a lower social level than all of the others, though it is possible, of course, that she's going to go back up again. Well, uh, I, I offer the thought to you. It's interesting to see how you can ring the changes on one, heroic styles, and two, levels of literary mode. And uh, go going back to that idea of literary modes, it's clear, I think, that Tolkien's fiction doesn't exist in just one of them. It exists in all of them. That's one of the reasons for its success. In the Silmarillion, he's very close to myth, which also pops up here and there in Lord of the Rings. Um, the main mode of Lord of the Rings is, however, romance. It's full of people who can command the dead, ride on eagles, talk to trees, become invisible, and it's also full of non-humans like Ents and Balrogs and Nazgul and Trolls and all the others. On the human side, though, many of the characters are not myth or romance. They're high mimesis. They're leaders and heroes and champions. Better than us, you might say, but not superior to their environment. Someone like Boromir is a warrior which we could not approach the scale of. But just the same, he's, he's mortal and he has no uh, special superhuman qualities. Meanwhile, of course, very obviously, and a great part of the success of, of the, the book, the hobbits are clearly low mimesis. They're like us, or, or they're like we would be in this very challenging environment. And there's even a touch of the ironic mode in the character of Gollum. And actually, I would say also, even in those uh, prize fatheads, Pippin and Merry, who are there to add some of the time uh, a touch of comedy to the whole story. But, you know, Professor Fry missed out one mode in his ladder. Or anyway, he missed out one genre. And that's fairy tale. It's the oldest and most widespread literary genre in the world, though they rarely study it in departments of literature. I always get in some crack about departments of literature. I'm sorry, I can't control myself. Um, anyway, the thing about fairy tale is it's like talking. It brings in characters from all over the ladder of modes. In it, kings and queens rub shoulders with the oppressed underclass, like Cinderella. Its heroes are often underclass as well, like the brave little tailor in Grimm, who's very like Bilbo, the brave little grocer. They meet men of extraordinary strength, who may in fact be weir bearers, like Beowulf, or like Beowulf, in the fairy tale that underlay the epic in Tolkien's opinion. So much was it his opinion, you know, that he actually went and wrote the tale, which he thought the epic Beowulf must have been derived from. It's there in his 2014 publication, Sell It Spell, which means wonder tale, which is another way of saying fairy tale. Well, um, on the whole, the heroes and heroines of fairy tale are a bit like hobbits. They're people who are out of their depth in the fairy tale world, but they survive by luck and cunning and by fair dealing. If I could offer you a piece of advice from fairy tale, always share your last sandwich with an old crone. <laughs> she may not be an old crone, but even if she isn't, that's what you should do. And another good piece of advice, which Bilbo got in the end is, don't throw stones at thrushes. <laughs> now, thrushes also may be more important than you think. Tolkien's mode, in fact, and, and this is what he's bequeathed to the modern imagination, is fairy tale on steroids. But I'm not sure what that tells us it's about the zeitgeist or the spirit of the age. OK, now I'm moving here very much into the land of speculation, where anyone's opinion is as good as anyone, others, uh, anyone else's, especially mine. Why has heroic fantasy become so popular? Well, one thing is that the early 20th century disillusionment with the idea of heroes has, I think, run its course. None of us has had to go through the ordeals of Tolkien's time, World War I, and Christopher Tolkien's time, World War II. That social trauma is over, and we hope it stays over. Heroes, then, are possible once more. Yeah, but maybe we're looking at another social trauma, 
another kind of disillusionment. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me for being personal once more and returning to the theme of leadership. In my nearly 60 years of academic life, I've experienced enough, it is really nearly 60 years, honest, I'm not kidding. Um, it, uh, hang on a sec while I do some sums. Uh, my first article was published, no, I tell a lie. It's, um, it's actually 50 years, I counted wrong. My first academic article was published in 1969, and that's whatever it is, uh, um, 49 years ago. Okay, nearly 50 years of academic life, I've experienced another descending scale, and this is it. And if you could have the last slide, slide 10. This is a sad one. When I was a junior adjunct or assistant lecturer, all my bosses were war veterans. At Birmingham, Professor Shepherd, he'd been an infantry platoon sergeant. He wasn't even an officer. He was a sergeant. At Oxford, uh, my boss, Sir Richard Southern, he was an Oxford fellow on the outbreak of war, which is a big thing to be, and he resigned it immediately and went back to his home in Durham, and he signed on as a private in his county infantry regiment, the Durham Light Infantry. Other professors I knew had commanded tanks, like a one-eyed Professor Hope, or they'd been uh, frontline stretcher bearers. Professor Pascal was a Quaker, and so he wouldn't uh, use weapons, but he thought that if he wasn't using weapons, he should volunteer to do something really dangerous. So he became a frontline stretcher bearer at the Battle of Anzio. Now, all these guys were leaders, but then, I guess it was when I was about 40, so that's 30 odd years ago, we had a managerial revolution. And in, instead of the place being run by the professors who were veterans, we got professional managers. And these were often people who hadn't made the grade as teachers or researchers. And then actually it got worse. We stopped having managers and we got administrators. And the thing about them, and this takes me back to Denethor, is uh, they were invisible. When I was at the University of Leeds, the administrators were all up on the 11th floor of the 11th of the administrative building, and uh, the elevators all stopped at the 10th floor. <laughs> they were sending us a message, and it was like, go away, don't bother us. Well, this was pretty disastrous in every way. Um, a couple of years ago, I was invited to speak at the Center for Social Policy in Phoenix, Arizona, and they asked me to talk about what we could learn from hobbits about social organization. And I told them that what hobbits had and what we had been steadily losing and in fact steadily destroying was social cohesion. They all stuck together. They had their own disputes and so on, but they all stuck together. That's what the administrators destroyed. Unlike Professor Shepherd or Sir Richard Southern, the bosses didn't speak to the underlings anymore. They didn't know who we were and vice versa, because they were invisible. Well, that's my personal experience in a very limited way. But I have a feeling that this applies more widely and not just in universities. In fact, and this is me being personal again, I would go so far as to say that in Britain, in Europe, very obviously, and even in America, the political and managerial elites, our leaderships, have been very widely discredited. People don't trust them anymore. Westminster, Brussels, Washington, the level of trust has gone down very markedly. And it's accelerated by things like uh, the 2008 economic crisis. As uh, Queen Elizabeth said, and I am a loyal subject of Queen Elizabeth, I think she's lovely, um, but no one has ever called her an intellectual. No one has even thought of calling her an intellectual, but she said, to her clever managers and, uh, and uh, politicians, she said, didn't none of you ever see this coming? <laughs> and the answer was, well, well, actually they did, but they were making too much money out of it to actually do anything. And that I think has had a, a pretty, pretty profound effect on the, on the social psyche. I won't say we're looking at a leadership vacuum, but in politics at least, we're very short of heroes since three people to look up to. Fantasy, heroic fantasy, does supply that need. It gives us another image of government, of politics, of leadership. I know it's only in fiction, but maybe the genre is popular because it supplies a need. It fills a gap which we are conscious of. Well, talking anyway, that was just me speculating. 
Tolkien not only re-energized heroic ideals for an anti-heroic age by creating a whole spectrum of heroic images. He also made it very clear to his successors, George Martin and J.K. Rowling, and my friend Stephen Donaldson, who wrote the Covenanter series, and a whole gallery of writers of heroic fantasy, that that was the way to go. You couldn't have, so to speak, monological heroes anymore. You needed whole bundles of them. Dinaris and Tyrion and Jon Snow, Harry and Hermione and Ron Weasley. Well, you know, fill in your own examples from your own favorite examples of heroic fantasy. But, and this is what I often say, fantasy, heroic fantasy in included in that. They are not escapist genres anymore. They are powered by, and they are a response to the most pressing issues of real life. They're a kind of collective thinking machine to express what we feel we need, what we feel we've lost, what we feel we are losing. In that respect, it really does express the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist. So after I've gone through all that, it occurs to me that the PR person I mentioned at the start, the one who provoked me into this with a, with a blurb, I think she was right after all. Heroic fantasy really is the spirit of the zeitgeist. Thanks very much. Uh, I didn't put this on Twitch, but uh, I was curious about where uh, Professor Shippey saw Elrond and his uh, breakdown of leadership categories. So where do you see Elrond in your breakdown of leadership categories? Well, uh, I guess, uh, in a way, he's a, he's another uh, unifying character. Though uh, another thing I, I would say is that um, the characters are quite complex, uh, and you could say that uh, that uh, they, yes, uh, I I think um, it's interesting that the book and the film versions of Elrond are, are changed rather. In uh, in the book. I think Elrond is a very clear unifying character. In the film, they change things so that he is actually uh, reluctant to uh, to to join in uh, with the uh, with the humans, and he's uh, he's persuaded out of it uh, by Galadriel. So they've made a kind of uh, almost a kind of triangle story out of Elrond, Galadriel, and Arwen. But uh, but in fact, uh, uh, Elrond is uh, um, uh, he's a leader. He's also a counselor. He's the person who actually understands history and knows what it means. He's, uh, he's also, in a way, the project director because he's quite clear that the ring has got to be destroyed in Mordor. Um, but apart from that, he's also a, a kind of spokesman for the unification of all the free peoples. So he's, um, he's really a kind of um, uh, a leader figure from the stratosphere. Here. He's not. Uh, he's not down there with the troops at all. He's not. It's not that he's invisible, but for much of the time he is invisible. Actually, he's, uh, he he does not move outside Rivendell. So I think we have to take him as uh, as the uh, wise counselor type, um, and that is usually, I think, in epic, uh, uh, and they, they come up quite often in epics. Actually, you have figures like Hrothgar in Beowulf or Nestor in the Iliad. Uh, these are characters who uh, who uh, direct and comment on the heroes rather than joining them. Okay, uh, good. Here's a question from uh, uh, Matt DeForest. He says, I find it interesting the parallel between the diminution of the hero and the diminution of fairy. I wonder if there's a parallel between our heroes getting smaller at the same rate the fairies are getting smaller. Well, uh, that's uh, something I think that uh, was on Tolkien's mind as well. And the word he uses, of course, is dwindle, dwindle. Uh, the elves who stay on in Middle Earth uh, after the end of the Third Age know that they will dwindle. And that can mean uh, decrease in number, but it also means a decrease in size. And I think Tolkien was always a bit bothered about uh, contradictions in folklore. And one of the contradictions in folklore is that uh, uh, in in more recent uh, versions uh, fairies are very small 
whereas in uh, in older stories including the, the scandinavian fairy tales which you knew very well uh, the alvar are the same size as human beings and actually can be taken for human beings um so he what he, he wondered how it came about that uh, that the elves had dwindled down to being what uh, what the grooms called what do they call them vehicle mention little little whites um and uh, one of his examples one of his answers was in a way that uh, this is because they were they were cut off they uh, they they no longer had access to uh, to valinor uh, they not only dwindled in numbers and in visibility they also dwindled in size and in power so i think that was kind of one of his uh, ways of um, of reconciling uh, discrepancies in folklore tradition my question about the the levels of heroes I, do, don't you think it's sort of endemic of the human race to think of the people in the past as being much more heroic than than people in the present and that in fact the people in the present in their own way are probably just as heroic as Agamemnon and Hector and all of the uh, you know all of the heroes from from history I mean don't you think it's 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 always kind of we compare ourselves to this ideal that has been sent down to us through legend and myth and and we find ourselves wanting but in reality maybe we aren't so wanting after all yeah well it's a it's a it's a good question and of course it's a bit hard to um to come to a, a final answer first it's true that uh, there is this uh, strong tendency to say oh well the, the the great men of old they were bigger than us they were stronger than us look they could do things like build stonehenge which we can't do they must have been giants in the old days uh, so that's a, that's a, a fairly standard thought um it's also uh, easy i think to kind of um uh, you know, to 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 magnify the exploits of the past, but as, as you're saying, um, well, two things really. Um, I, I often think that uh, uh, if uh, we could, uh, shall we say, call back one of my Viking heroes from the past and say, uh, uh, "Look, uh, uh, Eric Bloodax," shall we say, "Look, Eric, um, what we want you to do is to sail a boat up to the Arctic Circle in winter." And as you do it, you will be under attack from other ships and from machines that fly in the sky. And also you'll be under attack from invisible machines underwater. Uh, now, uh, how about that? Well, I'm sure Eric Bloodaxe would say, you must be joking. I'm not gonna do that. Who but an idiot would volunteer to do that kind of thing? And yet that's what people have, have had to do. Uh, so uh, when it comes to uh, levels of of uh, endurance i think the modern world has nothing much to learn from the ancient one but on the other hand the ancient models are much more personal um modern warfare horribly dangerous though it is is very impersonal you don't see anybody um i often comment that uh, tolkien's friends who got killed in world war one they never saw the guy who shot them they never saw the guy who fired the shell and, and the guys who shot them or fired the shell, they didn't see them either. It was all uh, impersonal. Whereas uh, somebody like, uh, uh, you know, Eric Bloodaxe or Ivor the Boneless or any of the Viking heroes I've been writing about, that was very much face to face. Um, and that requires a different kind of, uh, a different kind of courage. Um, it's more hot blooded. Uh, that doesn't mean it's better. Uh, in fact, if I can quote uh, quote Slim again, uh, Tolkien's friend Bill Slim, he had quite a lot to say about courage. And he said, the, the first thing uh, that I remember, he said, um, the dominant feeling on a modern battlefield is loneliness. You don't have the solid ranks. You don't have the banners flying. You don't have the drums and trumpets. You don't have people kind of uh, standing shoulder to shoulder with you. Uh, you may be just off in the in the jungle on your own and you can't see anybody. So he said, that's what we've got to train people to get over. We have to train them in a kind of self-discipline. And another thing he said, he said that, um, I'm talking in a way, uh, you know, I think to be a, an old style hero with a sword and a battle ax, uh, you needed a lot of physical courage. Um, 
But uh, Tolkien is very good at pointing out that there's another kind of courage, which is Bilbo's courage. You know, Bilbo, he, he shows courage several times, but I think he always does it on his own in the dark. And another thing is, and this is slim again, he, uh, he was commenting on his experiences in World War II, and he said nobody, nobody could possibly fault his enemies, the Japanese, for physical courage. He said, but he thought their generals lacked moral courage. He said they, uh, they would not admit their plans had not worked. They would not admit defeat to the emperor. And he said that was a weakness. It meant they went on when they should have uh, called off. And that meant that actually their, uh, their casualties were very much higher and they ended in a much more drastic defeat than would otherwise have been the case. So there's physical courage. There's alone and in the dark courage. And there's moral courage. And actually a good example of moral courage again, surely, is a Bilbo. Not only does he give the Arkenstone over to Gandalf and the elf king Thranduil, he then goes back to the dwarves who have every reason to regard him as a traitor. But he goes back to the dwarves because he's one of the company. He uh, doesn't want to get Bumber into trouble for letting him over the wall. So Bilbo shows the kind of uh, alone in the dark courage and the moral courage. Um, but physical courage, uh, I'm sure it's there, but he doesn't have to display it very often, except perhaps when fighting spiders. But, uh, but he's, not, he's not, and he doesn't consider himself to be uh, a hero of the sort to uh, stand up and slug it out with sword and battle axe. So we have, uh, you know, we, we, have, we have different requirements for heroes, but the modern requirements are just as taxing as the ancient ones. And I think the ancient ones would be hard put to, uh, to match modern standards. And the modern heroes would probably be hard put to uh, match uh, the ancient standards. They're just different, different requirements. Another question is, can, can you think of any heroes, either literary or historical, that um, might have either straddled the line between the levels or maybe uh, move from one level to another um, as, uh, as their life went on? Yes, um, I'm sure there are such examples. I'm just trying to think of a good one. Um, um, it's not coming to me, um, uh, but I, I suspect that uh, if, I, if I thought seriously about the uh, kind of Arthurian legend, I would find examples of people who seem to be um, on the high mimesis level, they are normal. Yeah, perhaps an example might be Sir Gawain. Sir Gawain, you know, uh, in the poem that Tolkien translated, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, he's uh, one of Arthur's knights. The uh, strange green giant comes in and says, I've got an idea for a game. Um, we'll hit each other with a battle axe. Uh, you can go first. <laughs> and uh, Gawain, of course, uh, is urged to, uh, to, to, to take it on, or at least he volunteers, partly because he does not want King Arthur to do it. And he beheads the green giant who picks his head up and rides off. Well, uh, at that, that point, I think you might say Sir Gawain moves up from being a standard high mimesis knight and champion to being someone who is involved in romance, where he has to deal with pe people who are superhuman. Um, and he himself has to show qualities which are, uh, I think, still human, but he's being tested in a, in a superhuman kind of way. So actually, I think you can get stories which wobble on the edge of being one and then the other. But it's also, uh, I was thinking, actually, you know, here's another one. Um, uh, how about Don Quixote? I would say that he is an example. He starts off as ironic. You know, he's, he's insane. Uh, he's an old guy riding around on an old horse with a helmet he's made out of cardboard and which, you know, and, and, and with equipment which he can't handle at all um, because his mind has been addled by reading romance. But 
But as you move through Don Quixote, you begin to realize that although he's completely crackers and you can only look at him ironically, well, there's times when you stop looking at him ironically. There's an incident I remember where he comes upon some guys who are transporting lions in cages uh, to the zoo or the, the king's zoo. And of course, being Don Quixote, he says, lions, let them out. I'll fight them. And they do. Uh, well, of course, Don Quixote is, of course, completely nuts. But just the same, he's quite prepared to fight lions. So he's actually, uh, well, at the end of that, you're not quite sure how to take him, are you? Um, and in the same way, people are quite clever at using this sort of character. What about Sancho Panza, uh, Don Quixote's sidekick? He's very clearly uh, an ironic figure because he's, uh, he's a fat old chap who communicates mostly by by using very silly proverbs but actually you realize after a bit uh, the proverbs may be silly but he isn't he's actually pretty good he's quite smart uh, so actually you you change your views of him you may start by looking down on him but you develop a kind of respect as the story goes on so i think actually there are probably quite a lot of examples of people moving up from one level to another. Um, uh, you can start, as it were, on the ground floor and at least go up a floor or go up a floor or two, I guess. Uh, maybe there are better examples than that. But uh, Sir Gowen and Don Quixote, those are a couple I can think of. OK, let's collect another question from the audience. OK, I have a thought that it seems to me that one difference between heroism is exemplified by, say, Theoden, and heroism as exemplified by, say, Samwise, is the decoupling of heroism from the exertion of authority. Do you think that might be useful? The question is... Um, I, didn't, I didn't catch all of that. Can, can you relay that, Corey? Yeah, I'll, I'll, yes. Uh, the question is, um, in the difference between the heroism of someone like Theoden and someone like uh, Samwise, is perhaps the decoupling of their actions from their authority. Did I, did I get that right? Yes. So, Do you think that's useful yes. distinction? Yes, sure. sure. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, one thing. It's it's quite interesting, and uh, you know, I just thought of it with Don Quixote and Sancho Panza is the uh, liking for. Um, presenting heroes in pairs, uh, like Sam and Frodo, like Don Quixote and Sancho. And actually, there are some others I can think of. You know, they, they occur all over the place. I mean, another pair, you might say, is uh, if you ever watch the Jeeves and Worcester series, the comic series, you have Bertie Worcester, who's a complete idiot, and his manservant, Jeeves, who is supernaturally clever. And they operate as a kind of a team. And um, what was another one that uh, crossed my mind? Well, there's a whole series of historical novels set in the Napoleonic age by Patrick O'Brien, uh, sea stories. And the pair there is uh, Captain Aubrey, who's English and a naval officer, and Stephen Maturin, who's Irish and, uh, and a doctor and surgeon. And uh, they complement each other. Um, uh, Jack Aubrey is the character with the authority because he's an officer, but Stephen Maturin is much cleverer than he is and actually uh, uh, acts as a kind of uh, uh, guide very often in the same way as Jeeves and Worcester. Worcester is, is actually supposed to be the, the, the master and Jeeves is supposed to be the man, but it's the other way around, really. So uh, you can actually um, use pairs like that to kind of uh, complement each other and also, I think, as, as the questioner said, you're kind of uh, decoupling authority from the figure which is supposed to be the authority figure. You're actually uh, offering a, a slant view on authority and also actually a kind of uh, slanted view of wisdom. Who is the wise one? Who is the clever one? It may not be the educated one. It may be the other one or maybe they have different and complementing abilities. So that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, I think, quite correct that, um, that uh, uh, looking at them in pairs does actually um, 
ask the question of where authority comes from, and it may not be uh, where it's supposed to. Well, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Shippey, for showing up. I think next year we're going to schedule an entire day for you to uh, talk and, and ask questions. But unfortunately, our time has run out, so I'd like to thank you very much. Okay. Well, thanks, Corey. But if anybody has a question which they haven't had a chance to ask, you can contact me easily. Send me an email at shippey at slu dot edu slu.edu and I'll answer it as soon as I get the chance. Okay, and thanks very much for the invitation. Thank you very much. Good night all. <laughs>